Skolum. Okay, well, um, I'm very excited. I know it's early, uh, but we're going to do a lot in these next few hours. I've, basically what I've done, just so you know, is I've taken an entire graduate level curriculum in group counseling and I boiled it down and made it uh, interesting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, I teach this all the time and it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I've got two helpers with me. One is Isabel MC. Please stand up. Isabel is one of our, yeah, Isabel. So we know her already, right? She's run some groups, yes. Isabel is one of our staff members at uh, Care for Miami at the Counseling Center. And we are so happy. She recently graduated with her master's from another school, which I will not mention. <laughs> Barry, okay. Anyway, um, and then I've got another helper over here, Louie. Stand up, Louie. Louie, man. Louie is going to be an intern starting May at Care for Miami at the Counseling Center. And he's from an awesome school, Trinity. Yes, let's hear it for. I gotta do that, okay. All right, um, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna start with the storyline of the Bible. Okay, y'all have a little, this is like school. I know some of you love school, and you did great in school, you took awesome notes, right? Okay, so we're gonna start with the storyline of the Bible. Why do I do that? Because we need to know the foundation before we try to help people that come to us in need of regrouping, right? And so where do you go for the foundation? You go to the Bible. And from the Bible, what we're looking at is, I'm calling it the storyline of the Bible, what we're really talking about is uh, biblical theology. What the theology shows us in the scriptures about humans, okay? So what we're going to start with, I'll just, is it working? Here we go. Okay, let's talk about creation, right? We start with creation, and God created a perfect world, right? Everything was good except, do you remember this little line here? Except man was alone. Oh my, we are made for relationships, right? Dogs aren't necessarily made for relationships. Even though it's nice you can have a relationship with a dog, but dogs can be off on their own, but human beings are made for relationship, okay? And the climax of this creation was humans. And this is something that's very important when you think about those people that God's gonna bring to your group. That because we are human, we are created in his image. We think, we feel, and we act, okay? God's a thinking, feeling, and acting God, okay? It's very important because as we think about creation in this perfect world, when we come together, made in his image, we are gonna do all those three things, okay? Think, feel, and act, and that's what's gonna happen in your groups. That happens every time a human being is with another human being, okay? Now, why would we need to have regroup or any kind of time that we get together to kind of figure out what's going on and move forward in our life if we all know Jesus, right? And everything's perfect once you know Jesus, right? Excuse me, did somebody laugh? <laughs> Isn't that true? Don't we kind of think that way? Our marriages are gonna be perfect, our kids are gonna be perfect, <laughs> our jobs are gonna be perfect, our bodies are gonna be perfect, right? <laughs> no, that was what we call creation. <laughs> We're not living theologically speaking, in the creation time, are we? No, because you know what happened right after creation? Ah, we had a little thing called the fall. It's a theological term, Genesis chapter three. I highly recommend you spend time dissecting those verses, because they are the core of what it means to be human living right here and now. The fall, humans sinned. It wasn't just Adam and Eve, but because of what they did, that's infected all of us, right? So. Because of the sin and the disobedience, we then have the consequences which continue to today. And I hate to tell you, the world is slowly falling apart, right? I don't need to tell you about your bodies, do I? <laughs> right? Your bodies are falling. You can do whatever you try to do, but it's still going to happen, right? Right, ladies? You hit that magic 5-0? Uh, they never tell you how bad it is. It's bad. I just want to tell you now. All right? And then guess what? This sin affects relationships. Ladies are still laughing over there, aren't you? Because you know what I'm talking about. Relationships. Tell me of a perfect relationship. There are none. 
because of the fall. You come to Jesus, your husband comes to Jesus, your kids come to Jesus, you still got broken relationships. Did you hear me? Very important. I'm not sure we really believe that because we act as if we should have perfect relationships. You know, the beauty is when you live in a broken world, in broken relationships, that you can still love. And that takes a lot, doesn't it? So, and inside of us, there's brokenness. Some of us are born with some DNA. I know I have certain DNA that said, no matter what you do, yes, I was in sports in high school, college, I had a scholarship, played sports, the whole thing. It didn't matter when I turned 40, no, excuse me, 30, 40, whatever. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I got diabetes. It didn't matter. I ate good. I did everything, but I had a little DNA, genetic thing, boom. I could try all I can. Now, some of you have some genetic markers there that you have because of your family that has depression in it. Or something that might lead you towards substance abuse that you can't have just one. But the other person can't because they don't have that DNA. So within us, in our bodies, we're broken, aren't we? Okay. But the good news is that redemption, immediately after the fall, God put into motion his plan that ultimately would be through Christ the Son, we would all be redeemed. Okay? Now, historically speaking, we are not living in redemption. I, I hate to tell you that. We're living in the fallen world. We're living in the consequences of the fall. Redemption is what we're looking forward to, right? And we believe that that hope is because of what, of what Christ's victory was over sin. You understand? Those are theological concepts. And sometimes we don't like to study theology. It's boring. I love studying it because when I look at Scripture and I understand how God made us, I realize, wow, I'm broken. But because of Him, the future redemption I'm going to be made whole. But while I'm in this world now and the brokenness, look at this. We can help people get victory over sin in the broken world as we then become agents of moving people forward to that hope. You understand? And that's a spiritual truth. It's also an emotional, psychological truth. I can tell you that as a therapist. It's very, very true. To give people that hope, but that's a tough thing because when you're in pain, you want it done now, when you know, yesterday. But you gotta sit sometimes in the pain, right? Before you can move forward. Okay. And then the final one is the restoration. And then you know what? I forgot to put new heaven and new earth here, but oops, uh oh my. That was bad. I can't go back. Can I go back? I pressed it wrong. Okay, I pressed it wrong. Um, can I go back? To, to which slide? Restoration. Put it right after restoration. I'm sorry about that. Okay, great. Okay. So in this new world, we're going to have no sin, no results of sin. Okay, so now let me click. Okay, so where do we live now? Now we live right here. All right? Okay, so now let's talk about how this plays out. Okay, I've already mentioned this. Remember, this side of heaven, there's no perfection, but this is not the end. Okay. All right, let's talk about marriages real quick as an illustration. What is a good marriage? Yell it out. What's a good marriage? And don't peek at the next slide. Or don't look at that slide. I know you're already looking at it. If someone were to ask you, what makes a good marriage? Communication. Communication. Trust. Trust. That's big. Honesty. Loyalty. Right. Forgiveness. Right. Right. Love. Oh, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Yes, love, one, one, one. Okay. <laughs> this quote I heard over 25 years ago. I've only been married 16 years, but I got married at, I hate to say it, 39. I was really old when I got married. I never thought it would happen. But when I heard this quote, I said, whoa. What is a good marriage? Two sinners who know they're sinners and ask for forgiveness and forgive each other's sins. And the final tag is daily. I didn't put that in there because I wanted you to pay attention. Daily. So that when someone really realizes and you see that mirror up to who you are and the things you've done, right? 
then you have the ability to not only ask for forgiveness, but to give it freely, right? But I don't know a lot of marriages like that. Do you? Honestly? No. We're going to see why right now. Good old Adam and Eve. We owe everything to Adam and Eve. <laughs> good, bad, and the ugly, because it's all good, bad, and pretty ugly. <laughs> From the start, they really messed up, didn't they? All right? So, obviously, Adam needed someone because he was not to be alone, and he needed what? A helper. And he called her woman, right? Because she was taken from him. You know that old saying, not from under the feet so he could stomp on her. You've heard that, right? Not from above him so she could, yeah, okay. From the side, right? Okay. Do you have Adam and Eve, but the next verse there, we're just speeding through here, and I want you to try to follow this because it's very important. They began a new home. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, I'm Cuban. How many in here are Cuban? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, look at me carefully. <laughs> I'm not speaking to anybody from Jamaica or anywhere else. Or any other place, I'm just, and everybody else who's wonderful gringos, just hold still. I'm going to get to you in a second. Because okay. I need to speak to my people first. Okay. Do you know what it means to leave and cleave? Yeah, that's all I got to say, because this guy just went to me. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. Leave to cleave. I'm going to tell you right now, up there in that counseling center where I work and my people work here, the big issue is there's not a whole lot of cleaving going on because <laughs> there ain't a whole lot of leaving yeah. and by leaving I don't mean physical leaving I mean emotional you leave to cleave men ladies that is your new home and I can't tell you how many times the issue is and I'm not talking the in-laws because it takes the man or the woman to be able to cut the umbilical cord because mommy's never going to cut it. Neither is daddy. You understand? You all know what I'm talking about, right? Leave to cleave? Oh, yeah, okay. I hear the same thing happens in Jamaican and Haitian cultures too, right? Of course it does. The ones that don't struggle with it is the American, right? <laughs> I'm playing with you because you know what? According to this, everybody. Some cultures just know how to do it better. <laughs> and you feel responsible. And I'm not saying, you know, in that verse, honor your mom and dad, you know, honor your mother and father, right? That does not take precedent over leaving and cleaving. And if you heard the heartache that I hear, or that we hear, when a spouse says he loves his mom more than me, and, she, and he's like, no, I do not. I do not. I need to honor her. Leave to cleave. Understand? Then we come to the big one. Right after the fall, and this is what directly impacts groups and, and, and really any kind of supportive thing. As soon as they sinned, they saw each other, what? Straight through. And they felt, what? No shame. Excuse me, this is right before the fall. They were naked and felt no shame. So, this shame word is huge. When we talk about it in psychological circles, that is the core of just about all emotional kinds of struggles. Okay? I'm not talking biological or biochemical. I'm talking about... Um, relational and emotional because the beauty of the marital covenant is that you are naked and feel no shame before you think that's all physical it's not about the body it's about the core of who you are he sees you on that night pure with no shame whatever your past was it's gone you see him the same way right that's the way it was at creation. But a little thing got in the way. It was called disobedience. 
the fall, and now we all struggle with shame. You got it? And so we're going to hide. And what happens in a group that is a functioning group, and we're going to get to that next week and how, the group, how groups progress and how you become a more functioning group, you are able to be free and open and vulnerable and to the best of your human ability, you don't have shame. You understand? How many relationships do you have where you can be really open and honest? I would love to say that happens in church. Church is the worst place. If I had a real big problem, I don't know that I'd go talk to anybody. I'm sorry, and I work here. Why? Because we have to put up facades, right? When in reality, somebody asked me this morning, how are you doing? I said, I'm okay. The truth is I'm a mess right now because at three o'clock this morning, my dog, who I've had 16 years, one year longer than my husband, <laughs> um, he's, on his, he's on his last legs, you know what I mean? And my husband's words, hospice, human hospice. And I keep saying, you know when people are ready to die, is he ready to go? <laughs> my husband's like, oh no, dogs are different. But I've never lost a dog, so I'm, I'm having a hard time, right? But I can say that to you because that's not real shameful, is it? No. But you get it, don't you? I can tell by the way you're looking at me. You connect with me on that pain, don't you? If I said to you, my nephew died of a brain tumor less than two years ago, and I had to see him die, you connect with me, don't you? Okay? Because we can connect on that level. But what about a deeper level? You gotta trust me, don't you? Better yet, I gotta trust you, and I don't know that I trust you. Do you know where trust gets built? In human relationships where there's vulnerability and that shame begins to get lifted. That's what we group is about. Forget what the topic is, whatever topic you're thinking you want to do, you've got to develop the group to the point that there is an ability to get past the shame. And it starts, you know where it starts? The leader. Every single one of you in this group. You have to be the one that models it and begins to develop it as the group goes on. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna go fast here. Um, temptation, again, the key was in the verses that you wanna be like God, then eat of the fruit. And then let's get into, real quick, real quick. Is the shame, and then we're gonna divide it up a little bit into men and women. In each of your groups, you're going to have one or the other or both. You know what I mean? You're going to have a male, you're going to have a female, or males and females, right? Is there any other option? <laughs> I guess you can have a dog. <laughs> you know, that's a male dog or a female dog. There's no, there's no getting around it, right? So we're going to look just for a few minutes at the tendency of men and the tendency of women when they are in the fallen world of shame and cover up, how they react. With Adam, verse six, she gave some to her husband who was with her and he hated to. This is right after the debate with Satan, you know? With the, and she turns to her husband and he gave her some and he ate it. Now, and I want you to go home and check these verses out carefully, okay? Don't just take my word for it. Be, be like the Bereans and, and make sure I'm doing this right. But that 20 some years ago, I heard this verse and I heard someone teach on it. And he went to the Hebrew word. Uh, and what shocked him, this is a very famous psychologist who has a master's of divinity, so he knows the word, he knows Hebrew. And he said um, he had never seen it this way that she turned and he was right there. Okay? So when I got married, and I married a Hebrew scholar myself, I asked him, check it out, honey, what do you think? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, he was right there. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm having a debate with Satan, and here in your state, come here, Louis, get up here, Louis. I have to use Louis here. Louis short like me, so get up here. I'm having a debate, you're Satan, you're talking to me. Come here, yeah, she's, get down. We're having a debate about eating this, and I'm, and she's really good, okay, she's like, and I'm trying to debate, and you're like, you're standing right there. Quiet. Quiet. Silent. Rather than, no. Thank you. <laughs> that was good, Louie. <laughs> Look at that image. Look at that image. Powerful, guys. And the guys are looking at me right now. I can, I can feel 
the darts. They're coming at me right now. Okay. Wait, wait. Now, one more time. Come here. I just, I told them I'd be using them. They had no idea. So, okay. He didn't do that, did he? But here's what I'm afraid might have happened if he did. Go ahead and do it. Well, wait a minute. I think I can do it better than you because I, I know how to talk. <laughs> right? And so what happens to a man when <laughs> shame, shame, because you know what, at the core, and I'm, okay, and I'm going to tell you something, I can do this now after 20 years of teaching, I've been doing this 20 years, I've been married 15, and I taught this when I was single and a virgin, so don't tell me you have to have experience to teach what the word shows. When you step in the way of a man and totally emasculate him, oh, now I'm getting nice looks from the guys. <laughs> I just saw some of these noddings. You totally shame him. Totally. Now, there may be very good reasons why you do that. Because in the past, he has totally not stepped in. Or when he has stepped in, he's made stupid decisions with your money. Hmm? <laughs> or lost a job and you've had to work three. I understand, ladies. I totally get it. Okay? However, that shame, and I'm not a, ladies, look at me. I'm not a man, so I don't get that. I don't get it. It's very strange to me. We'll talk about the women in a minute. <laughs> But at the core of what a man feels when a woman totally steps in and disrespects and basically shuts him down, you're affecting his male sexuality. Do you understand? I'm not talking about sex, his gender, what it means to be a man, what it means to speak truth. So what you get is the silence of Adam. And a lot of men, when they've been silenced, it's not, it's, it's part of the curse from Adam. It is the curse from Adam. So what happens is they go to one extreme. They get totally run away, silent, or they go to the opposite extreme, which is total anger and control and violence, because you will not do that to me, woman. You will never do that to me again. Okay? That's the curse that I deal with. So put that in the back of your mind, in your head, as you think about the groups and who's going to be in your group. And... Whoops. Well, I'll get to the woman in a minute. Well, let me go ahead and get to the woman now. Um, with women, it has to do with what you did. She continued the conversation and she took the... So what women do in their shame and their hiding and their fear of the man not coming through or being totally... I was single until I was 39. So this applies to single women too, ladies. Is I'm going to take control. I'm going to do it myself. What, do I need a man? I don't need a man, do I? I need, and you say that to yourself, even though God made you for a relationship. I don't need a man. As a matter of fact, it's even easier to hang out with my girlfriends. And you can see how homosexuality would be very tempting. Because who can hurt you more than that opposite sex and that vulnerability? A man. A woman can't. She thinks like me. I'm safe for her. Get it? That's not what God intended, but I could see how people go that way, right? You following me? Is everybody following me? Yeah. I need some... Okay. <laughs> so, as soon as they ate, their eyes were open. Check it out. And they realized what? They were naked. And what? They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They hid from each other. And since then, till now, till redemption, I mean, till restoration, this is what we're going to struggle with men and women in this struggle. We're going to hide, hide, hide. Hide, hide, hide. When that man gets totally put aside because his job just fired him and he feels this much of a man and he comes home and the wife is like, oh, you did it again? Well, you know where he's going to go? He's going to go to the porn site on the computer because she thinks you're great. And she never requires anything of you. You understand? He still loves you, but he feels this much of a man because he just lost his job. 
Okay? And he just goes to that. And I'm just giving you examples that I've heard in the counseling room. I'm not making this up. Right? So, they did. And everybody's still hiding from each other. Um, oops, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> what happened? Okay? Okay, but look at the beauty of verses 8 and 11. They're hiding from each other, and they're trying to hide from God. <laughs> and God says, guess what? You can't hide from me. That's the good news. You can't hide from God. He's going to seek you out. He's going to find you. That's exactly what he did. He will find you until he finds you. You think you came to him. Well, I got news for you. He was searching you out all along. You just finally turn around and saw him. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful picture. The reality is that in your groups that the Lord is leading you to lead, you're going to help people be found by God through relationship. Because God made us for relationship. Now, I'm going to say that again. Listen carefully. Through your groups, as you let people be found by God through relationships that you allow, God's going to find them wherever they are. Okay? And, and I'm not necessarily talking about people getting saved, y'all. I'm talking about the, the hurting ones that are sitting in the pew every Sunday morning, dying inside with nobody to talk to. God's there and he's going to search and find you because you're going to, you've been hiding, they've been hiding. But here I go again. Who sets the stage? You do. If you're hiding, if you're pretending everything's great, why would anybody open up to you? Excuse me. That's why sometimes I, I mean, I'll confess, sometimes I like hanging out with non-safe people more. I like to hear people struggle. You know, I like to hear truth. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that. I like to hear people say they struggle. Not everything's great. My kids are perfect and, you know, praise God. My kids aren't perfect. Okay, and I keep going here, moving on. Okay, now, we're almost done, okay? Hang in here just a little bit longer. The blame game, okay? When he came, when God comes and finds him, says, who told you? Who told you? Well, guess what they did? They blamed each other, you know? Adam says, the woman you gave me, right? And he says, the serpent. I mean, you know, you know. so you're mad at your kids because they don't take responsibility, but we do the same thing all the time, right? Well, here's, here is the, the powerful thing. It goes back to the men and the women and the whole issue of the hiding and struggling relationally. The consequence, okay? The first part of those verses, the consequence is that eventually the serpent is going to get stopped by Jesus and those are messianic prophecies right there about Jesus coming, all right? But then the next two consequences relate to you and me as men and women. For women, um, it's going to be, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to, what? Control your husband, but he will rule over you. I remember reading that when I was single, or I was single a long time, no, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not married. I really don't know what it means. Then I got married, and God's will was that we would adopt two children, so I never had childbirth. Thank God. I don't know that I could have. <laughs> Who am I? So it doesn't apply to me. No, yes it does. Yes it does. Because what we're talking about, look at here. Control your husband, okay? He will des you will desire, but he will rule over you. What we're really talking about is relational pain. What do women constantly have problems with? Relational pain. You know, middle school. She hurt me. She looked at me wrong. She did whatever. My girlfriends don't love me. Maybe. This is the epitome of it, because who can hurt you the most? Your husband, okay? But even if you're single, you still have relational pain, right? And that desire to rule over him, okay? That gets birthed out of you as a woman give birth. I was single until I was 39, but I had a lot of children running around. Spiritual babies that I gave birth to, okay? So, ladies, go home and meditate on that for a little bit, because that issue of control, that is the issue for women. Bar none. Control. The house has to be a certain way. This has to be that way. Oh, I hear the bones in the back. What was that? Right? You know what I'm talking about. Ladies, look at me. Right? Yeah? Can you control those kids? You tell me. 
No? But you do everything in your marriage, in your life, and it's your kids, 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 kids. Right? And then one day, guess what happens? They leave. Oh no, maybe they don't, because you keep... <laughs> no, you want them to come back, right? Yes, you do. So, God forbid we teach them responsibility. Let mommy take care of them. And then I see the son up in my office saying, my mother won't let me grow up, and I'm 35. Huh? Because that control, maybe you can't control your husband or your job, right? Single ladies, whatever. <laughs> um, guess what? You cannot control anything. Zippo. God's in control. And if you don't trust him, really trust him, you're going to try. And there's many times you think you're doing godly, wonderful things for God. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you being in control. <laughs> it does. And when you see that close up and God through his spirit shows you that, and you're broken of it, there is freedom, ladies. Freedom. Okay? Ladies, well, we can talk more. I don't want the guys to hear everything. Because <laughs> then they're going to have too much control. <laughs> no key. I'm being taped, aren't I? <laughs> don't let my husband see this race. <laughs> okay, now let's go to the guy. Oh, no, this one's interesting because this one I don't quite get. Okay. I'm a professional woman. I had my PhD before I was ever married, you know, whatever. I liked my job, and my job was a job, you know? It was a job. I, I mean, I do get fulfillment out of it, but, you know. But for men, look at this verse. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree the fruit I commanded you not to eat, the grandest curse because of you, all your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Work. In those days, it was work out in the field. Now it's work, right? When, when your job isn't going well, your careers, and my husband's had three different careers. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking when he, we, he was a professor at uh, Trinity, Trinity Close, it's the undergraduate school. He was a PhD Bible professor, no job. So we moved to Atlanta and we just had a little baby. And he goes up there and that school started, he was the first professor of Old Testament theology at a very, at a seminary that just got started, and guess what happened one year later? They closed the seminary because of 9-11. You have a PhD and you just were part of two closing of universities. <laughs> what do you think that does to a man? I have no clue because I'm not a man. I just said, get another job, honey, I'm not working, I got a baby. <laughs> I didn't get it, I didn't get it. At the core of who he was, devastation. And I couldn't relate. And I, you know, just because you teach it doesn't mean you live it, right? But I remember one day looking at him and thinking, oh my goodness, we don't have a paycheck coming in, in two months. The baby is four months old. I don't know anybody in Atlanta and I can't get a job. And, and I said to him, what's plan B? And he looked at me and goes, plan B? And I mean, no, plan A. And I lost it, ladies, badly. I'm not proud of that moment. But you know what happened, what God used at that moment? When I saw his face, a godly man that God had brought to me at age 39, and I saw how my words crushed him, I just about died. And that's when I saw this, this reality and the reality of my sinful nature played out in this, because he was like, how do I take care of you? He said, I'll go flip burger the burger king if I have to, but he had worked all his life for this, right? Now, our economy right now has been this pretty bad for a while now, right? How many men out here are devastated? No? And we ladies just walk along like, get a job, go do it. Now, I'm not talking about lazy guys, right? I'm talking about men who really care, and they're that deep in their soul. There's devastation as a man, right? So this idea that work-related Struggle and pain. Look at the words. You will struggle to scratch a living. It's, I, I don't know how many men get up every morning and the thought is, yay, I can't wait to go to work. I don't know. I'm not a man. <laughs> is it fun? I guess sometimes it is, right? But at some point, it's got to be hard. But you still got to get up, don't you? Yeah. I, I don't 
get this part of it, but I would love for some men in a men's group to really talk about that and get to the core of that. And for men who didn't have fathers <clears throat> to lead the way. How many men, and don't raise your hands in this room, didn't have a dad to show them in that area? Much less emotional relatedness. That's even, you know, forget that, right? I'm talking about getting up, going to work, and pride in your work, things like that. Anyway, the relational pain that comes from that, that is the consequence of the fall. And men and women, those are the two areas they struggle. So every time you have a man or a woman or both in your group, remember those issues. Okay? Remember that. Last but not least, I think I'm done here, is um, they left Eden. We're not in Eden anymore. Right? <laughs> we're on this side of heaven. And you know what? We will, we, we will have sin. We're not perfect, but we bear God's image. And this is the world, this world. Reality, not denial. Reality is the world. We've been called to be what? His disciples. And to have a future of redemption. And when they're played out right, and you know, I, I heard a guy once say, when a man and a woman in relationship are functioning in a beautiful way of two sinners and forgiveness and all the things I've been talking about, and there is no shame, and, and when she blows it, she realizes it, and when he blows it, he goes through, I hurt you, I didn't protect you. When those kind of things get worked out, you know what that is? That's a taste of heaven on earth. Because the male image of God, the female image of God have come together, and the two together reflect God's image. And let me tell you what the world is looking for. That's what they're looking for. Reality. Not the fakeness that we go, oh, our marriage is great. No. Because you and I know it's not great. Stuff happens, right? So when you think about the groups and what we're trying to do here, remember, you're dealing with male and female. The image of that marriage is part of it, but it's more than that. It's relational pain and how to work through that. Okay, I think that's it. Questions. I, I, that was a lot. I just threw at you. You got it? But I, I want you to meditate on this. This is like a little devotional, right? Questions about how that might get played out in group? No, you're all quiet, right? I was watching you. I read the room. And I think, I, I think you guys are following me. I didn't check this room out. This part here much because Louie's there, so I don't know about Louie. You got it? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, um, let me tell you how we've divided up the seminar. That was the preamble, okay? What we're going to do today is some listening skills, talking about how to listen, and then some confidentiality things, some things with um, gossip, and then last but not least, suicide, because it's probably the most scary, <laughs> scariest moment in a group when someone says something that may be Oh my, they don't want to go on anymore. And I, and I want to make sure we get that. Next week, we're going to do more about what happens in the group, how the groups develop. Okay, and then we're going to throw in there also things like how to recognize more major emotional kind of things that you might need to know. Okay, and then that third week, we're going to do some of that too, and also be talking intermittently with Wayne and Nazi about the kinds of groups you guys want to lead. Okay, so, all right, so let's look at, um, y'all awake? You need a break? You need a stretch? You're good. <laughs> All the ladies are talking, the men are silent. Guys, yeah, you doing okay? <laughs> okay, alright, so basic introduction to group counseling, okay? Let's talk about this. I can't believe I'm standing still. This is good. Usually I don't teach like this. Camera. Okay. What we're looking looking at here is basic counseling skills. Notice how I didn't put two young young people. That's more my style right there. <laughs> okay, so we have active listening, processing, responding, and teaching. Okay, um, the hardest of these, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. It's the first one. <laughs> right, active listening. All of you are in here because you have a desire to do groups, to lead groups, right? And usually when you hear the thing, the, the word te lead a group, you think teach or Something, right? No, 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 no. These kind of groups, we want you to learn to listen. And so this is the easiest. This is the hardest, okay? So, 
a strong activist name. Okay. Definition. The act of listening by the listener, okay, encourages the speaker to share information by providing verbal and nonverbal expressions of interest. Okay? It is verbal and nonverbal. Okay? To be honest, most communication is nonverbal. Okay? But in active listening, there is a verbal component to it. Okay? These are some of the skills. Now, if you were in my graduate class, we would spend weeks, <laughs> weeks, three hours a night going over these skills, attending, paraphrasing, reflection, feeling, summarizing. And I got Louie over here who just took those classes. How easy were those to do? Not at all. Not at all. Practice. That's, huh? Practice. practice, practice, practice. Okay? What? It's very good. It's counterintuitive to listen. It really is because, especially if someone's like crying out and just saying, oh, "Where's God in this?" Your instinct is like, "He's here." Let me give you the Bible verse. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Okay. Okay. Now, you can't cut that off, right? Okay. I'm gonna say. Oh, this is gonna be bad. Okay, I'm going to get censored later, just, okay. Sometimes, when someone is hurting, to say to them, I'm going to pray for you right now, is the worst thing you can do. That is the most powerful way to shut people up. Do you understand? Because that, that's not what they need to hear. They, you need, they need you to listen to them. My nephew, who was uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor, I will never forget, when that, when that brain tumor came back, he was getting ready to be wheeled in to get the MRI taken, where it was going to show his back. And I was there, and my husband was there, and my sister was on her way, and we knew what was going to happen. He just looked up at my husband and said, I feel abandoned by God. And we said nothing. We just held his hand. There was nothing we could say. At that moment in time, if I had said, I'm going to pray for you right now, I'm gonna, that was to alleviate my pain, not his. You understand? Very hard to do, but very healing when it's done. And those of you that have been on the opposite end, you know what I'm talking about. When someone just is sitting there with you and listening, very freeing, very freeing, okay? Okay, so attending is expressing awareness and interest in what the speaker is communicating. Move right along. Okay. That's a typo, speak it. Uh, <laughs> attending helps the listener better understand the client through careful observation. Okay. When you are paying attention, you make the person speaking feel relaxed, comfortable, helps them express their ideas freely, and this is big. They begin to trust you. What you want to do is develop trust. If you're not attending, if you're looking at your watch, if you're thinking, Okay, I gotta close the group up in about 10 minutes because they're gonna be knocking at the window. You're not attending. And I know that's hard because there are constraints. You have to get out of the room, right? But you gotta pay as much attention as you can, okay? Besides trust, it also makes the person in the group want to be more active in the group. That was a previous slide, I missed that. Okay, so, appropriate eye contact, facial expression, maintaining a relaxed posture, all of these, okay, are very important. The body language. There's a um, acronym called SOLER. S O L E R. Write that down. I didn't put it in the slide. You heard of that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? S O L E R. Okay. Why don't you, my two little helpers, come on up here? SOLER. Put the chairs up here and we show what SOLER looks like. I think these are basics. You would think, duh. But I'm telling you, we don't do it. We don't do it. Okay, so you're talking to each other. You're in a, no, that's more like a therapy. You're in a group, and you're, you're, you're leading the group, and she's talking. And solar means S, you squarely look at them. But let's say you're in a group. How are you going to do that? Well, you turn your body. Duh. You ever been in a group and the person's talking and they're just sharing, and everybody's like, you know, turn. Not just the leader, everybody. But guess what? 
If you're the leader and you're turning, guess what everybody else does? They follow you. <laughs> Duh, they're gonna follow you. So you turn, okay? You have, uh, you're, okay, open, you're open, meaning, okay, show me the opposite of open. Yeah, there you go, that's real good, right? Right there. This makes you wanna really open up, doesn't it? No, of course not. Okay. No, see, so you, uh-huh, you're open, you lean towards the person, you give eye contact, and you're relaxed. Solar, S-O-L-E-R. You squarely look at the person, you're open, it means you don't have cross arms, cross legs, things like that. You lean towards them. Okay, I'll have a doctor's skull down here. Right, this is what I'm gonna get. He's a man, and she's a woman. Yeah, what did I tell you in the beginning? They're either one or the other, right? Duh. Well, oh, but it could be sexual. Really? That's sexual? I don't see sexual there. If that's the first thing that caught across your mind, <laughs> take a deep breath and you need to talk to Wayne. <laughs> you need to chill for a minute. And now that was going sound very controversial and I'm going to get edited in again, I'm sure. Because <laughs> I say this when I teach my classes. In the Christian world, the evangelical subculture, we have this issue that we think men and men and women and women. Okay, I get it. I understand why. I do. I get it. Because when I talk to a bunch of women, you get me. You know, you get me. Right? I get it. And there's some things that, okay, I, I get it. But I'm going to tell you what I've seen in therapy and what I've seen in groups. That the power of a woman who has been hurt and abused and manipulated by a man, an evil man, the power with a godly man who's not sexually exploiting her, but is there for her as Christ is and just listens, the healing power of this is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I say this when I teach my classes. The power of you, Louie, we need some good men as therapists. The power of you to be a strong male to this hurting female is incredible. It's not the same move. It's not the same when she's sharing and I'm doing solar like this. And I'm like, yeah, I get it, honey. All men are dogs, you know, which is what usually happens in women's groups. You know how many times I've been in groups it's all about hating men? I'm sick of it. I'm serious, it's all about hating men. Why? God, we're made for men and men. I mean, that's crazy. Shut up. I don't even like, that's why sometimes I don't like to go to women's groups. Because it's all about hating men. <laughs> you need to edit that. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> please hear me. Please hear my heart. I, there's a place for women's groups in men. I understand that. But at some point, wouldn't it be God glorifying, sit down, Louie, <laughs> to have someone like Louie listening, you know? And, and her saying, oh my, not every man is blah, 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 right? Now, I do know that things happen. I'm not crazy and stupid, but I'm gonna tell you where this gets dealt with. It gets dealt with in supervision, where Louis says, oh God, I'm counseling that Isabel lady, and there's a fleeting thought that went through my head. I mean, yeah, she's very attractive. That's okay. She's a woman, you're a man. If you can't control yourself, then you need to not see, not be there anymore. He's not going to do anything because he's taking that to the God and the supervisor. Okay? Please hear my heart because I get blasted on this one at Trinity all the time. My students are like, but doc, my doctor's going, I go, hold on a second. I understand why the protections are there, but I've seen the opposite too. I've seen the beauty that can come from a healthy male female relationship. Do y'all follow me? So, those of you that are thinking of doing a male a couples group, awesome. Now, if there's someone in the group who has the spouse had an affair, we, we can get to that one later, <laughs> they're going to have some trust issues, right? So you need to, as the woman in the group, if she's the one who's, if the husband had, if you need to be able to talk to her, you know, there, there may be times you need to meet with them separately, okay? You see what I'm saying? But the reality is that there's beautiful healing that can take place there. You all got that? Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, you all ready to do some more? You ready? Okay, here we go. Let me see. Slot. 
Okay. Here's an example of attending. It's on your slide. She says, I'm so tired I cannot sleep, so I drink a little wine. Uh, he says, mm-hmm. It's a well-timed, mm-hmm. Not a fake, mm-hmm, but really listening. And she says, when I wake up, it's already too, it's too late already. He says, go on, what, what else? Because she's hesitating. See, these dots mean hesitation. Too late for my work, and my boss fired me. I see. What did he, he didn't say much. He just listened, he was there, he attended. So, okay, so I think the next slide, yeah, okay. I'm just giving you this as a case study. We, we may not do 15 minutes, we may just do five minutes, because I think I want to get as much through this as possible. I want you at your tables to divide up into twos, just to practice, and uh, Isabel and Louie are going to go around and help you. This is a little case study. Uh, the speaker asked the listener about the availability of medical help to deal with withdrawal symptoms. I'm using a specific example of someone who's going through withdrawal and they're asking for some help to deal with those symptoms. The listener noticed that the client is wringing his hands and looking very anxious. Okay, just role play. One of you be the one who's, you know, having withdrawals or hands are wringing, the other one's just the listener. I just want you to practice, attend, do the solar, you know, as much as you can. It's going to feel kind of weird, you know, because you're practicing it, but do it anyway, okay? Do it for a few minutes and then flip and just make up the story. It's called role play and you can make it as creative as you want. All right, we're going to go around and help you. All right.
these two right here. We have volunteers right here. <laughs> she, I was selecting her. Hold on, hold on, everybody listen up. Hold on. Okay, ready? Okay. I was the listener and it felt very uncomfortable. I did not know what to say to her. And I was just trying not to look a deer in the headlights and say the right thing, not the wrong thing. And I didn't Okay, awesome, perfect. You know why? Because you saw what you may not have done right. That's okay. But let me tell you one of the little tricks of the trade is therapists, right? Should we tell them one little trick in the trade? Sometimes in therapy or in group, if you don't say anything, that's beautiful. It's better than saying stupid things, which most people do. So you may have had a look like what deer in the headlights, right? But let's ask you, did you feel it? What did you think what she was looking at? Um, honestly, <laughs> I wouldn't get into that. Because you could I, I was really in real life. So you overwhelmed her. You overwhelmed her. Okay. You felt overwhelmed. Okay. So when you're overwhelmed, what? I was freaked out. She was freaked out. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Very seasoned professionals who run groups get freaked out. It's okay. Be honest and say, I have no idea what to say. Because you don't. It's okay. It's okay. It is okay. Do you understand? So someone in your group, and we'll talk about how to, if there's someone in your group who's dominating and dumping everything, that's a different story. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Make a note. We gotta make sure we cover that in the future, okay? But when someone is saying something and you're really overwhelmed and you don't know, say so. I don't know what to say. I really don't. I'm so sorry. And just be quiet. Silence is a wonderful, um, it's a technique, it's a tool, it's reality. You don't know, you didn't know what to say. That's okay. And so you just let it be there, okay? All right, anybody else? Anybody else over here? Anybody? No, nobody else? It was hard. Because we're married, so we're Yeah, um, we're married, so when, when I was the person that was hurting and she was hearing me, she listened very well, but then she lost it. She started laughing. <laughs> well, hmm, I don't know about that. No, because <laughs> you're married, right? It was hard to do the role play, right? Yeah, that's okay. Um, did anybody fear, feel like they were tearing up as they heard the story? You did. You did over here. You felt like they were tearing up. Did you control your tears? Okay. Did you see her tearing up? You didn't see it, but someone else saw it. Okay. Let's talk about that real quick. Someone's sharing her story, and you tear up. As a leader, bad or good? Why is it good? You're connected. Because you're sympathetic. You're sympathetic. There's a thing called empathy that we're going to talk about. Yeah, feeling what they're feeling. You know, like, that's okay. Tearing up is fine. Okay? And then, no, if you start... <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> you don't want to do that, right? But you know what? I, you know what? I don't know, I never had to that extreme, but you know, I've heard horror stories and tearing up is okay. Okay? And and be able to say, you know, I, I mean, Jesus wept, right? I mean, come on. We're feeling, thinking, acting beings, just like God, feeling is okay. Right? Okay, now what we're gonna do, we're gonna just we're gonna skip to paraphrasing real quick. We're gonna do it again all this time. You're gonna make up the story. Some of you made up your own stories, right? Okay, now let me ask you this before we go on. I'm, I'm doing a little impromptu here. I'm changing some things I want to do. Some of you know the kind of groups you want to lead, right? Okay, I want you to pretend that's the group you're leading. Whatever that is, you, I don't know what it is. Some of you want to do some grief and loss, and, you know, whatever it is. 
That's the story I want you to make up this time, okay? But we're going to look at paraphrasing. Let's look at this real quick. Because now it's not just attending and listening, it's actually paraphrasing. And I gotta do this real quick. Okay, it's not working. Okay. In paraphrasing, you are rephrasing what the person just said. So it's not just listening, okay? It's to really try to say it in a different way, okay? What they said. So you're using words that are similar to the clients, but usually less words, okay? You understand what I mean by that? Paraphrasing. And what that does is it communicates to the speaker that you understand what he or she is saying. Okay? So you're listening and you're going to say some of the words back. Okay? And remember, I, I teach this all the time in counseling. Uh, mistakes are your best friend. Again, if you think you got to do it just right, you know what you're doing? You're hiding. Remember that shame thing? I don't need... I know how to do it just right. No, you don't. I don't even know how to do it. I've been doing this 20 years. <laughs> Get over it. You're going to mess up. There's a book that I use in, uh, in my internship class for people who are just getting ready to graduate. It's called B Mistakes in Clinical Practice. A whole book about all the mistakes we make as therapists. Good book. Because I want you to know, we're human beings. We make mistakes. Therapists make mistakes. So you make mistakes. So if you don't, they're telling you the story, and you've got to paraphrase it back, and you're thinking, I have no idea what they just said because my stomach was just grumbling. <laughs> uh, that's not good. Uh, you say, here's a simple answer. Could you say that again? They're going to think I'm not listening. No, they're going to think you're not listening if you say something that has nothing to do with what they just said. But if you say, could you say it again? Guess what? They'll be happy to say it again. They're not going to say, oh, you're not listening. No, they're not. They're in pain. They want to say it again. And then you listen, so you, you catch yourself, right? There's no mistake that you can't make that, that is beyond forgiveness and grace by the people in your group if they know that you're there for them. And you're the leader, and that's why you're being vulnerable to, right? Okay, so paraphrase. All right, I think that's, let's try that. We'll keep, we'll skip that. Ready? Paraphrase? Got it? Make up whatever you want, pretending like you're in the group that you want to lead. Okay? All right, go. And we'll walk around.
study about, you know, needing a drink and alcoholic kind of thing, right? Okay. And then the, the Lorraine's going to share. What's your <laughs> Okay, the reaction I had as she was twisting and turning and telling me that she's an alcoholic was I wanted to give her a drink. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting that response, so that's why I asked her. Now think about it. <laughs> I love your honesty, Lorraine. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> Okay, well, right around the corner. Just go, girl. Go. But you know what the cool part is? Is that Lorraine was able to say, where'd that come from? You know, she just didn't say, oh, I'm such a bad person. She went deeper. She said, where did that come from? Because that's not her. She wouldn't normally think that way. Right? So that's a great question. When you're running and something comes out of your mouth and you're like, oh, or you don't say it, but you think it? Oh, you better look at it, ask the Lord to show you what that's about, okay? But she came up with the answer. I didn't have to say a word. Why don't you tell the answer, right? I'm a quick fixer. I like to fix things like this. So, that would have been a quick fix. <laughs> Give me that drink! Oh, that is so powerful! Oh my goodness, rain! Awesome! That's exactly right! Ooh, some of you are quick fixers! No, no, no! That, that's exactly right. And so, that is the power of being a leader and not hiding in shame. And thank you, I mean, the guts it took to say that. Now, you weren't on video, so that's good. Okay? <laughs> um, you know what? Ask God to show you things that you may need to work on as he moves you into this whole new ministry of we group. Quick fixing is one of them. Absolutely quick fixing. Okay, so now we're moving. Let's go to paraphrasing. No, no, we did that. Let's go to, what's the next one? Ah, oh, my favorite. Reflection of feelings, okay? All right. Reflection of feelings. Okay. Here, the listener expresses the speaker's feelings. Now, read this carefully. Either stated or implied, okay? You know, one of the things that most people struggle with is saying what they're feeling. And I hate to tell you, but evangelical churches are some of the worst places because we're really not allowed to feel anything bad. It all has to be good. So you ask someone, what are you feeling? Nothing. Nothing. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not feeling anything. But they're talking like this. I'm not feeling anything. No, nothing. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean I'm feeling something? You're mad. Mad? No, I'm not mad. Praise God, I'm not mad. <laughs> yeah, you're mad. No. You want to reflect the feeling that is said, stated, or implied. Okay? Now, you could reflect it wrong. That's okay. You could be wrong. Remember I said mistakes? You learn from that. You could be wrong. I don't know. But you try to perceive the emotional state of the speaker and respond in a way that what says you understand their emotional state, okay? So now you're going to do a, the, um, 
the practice of reflection. Now look at this example. Uh, I love this example. Okay. When I get home in the evening, my house is a mess, the kids are dirty, my husband does not care about dinner, and I don't feel like going home at all. You are not satisfied with the way the house chores are organized. That irritates you. Okay? That is reflection of feeling. To give this response, when I get home in the evening, my house is a mess, the kids are dirty, my husband does not care about dinner, I don't feel like going home at all. Whoa, what is your husband doing all day? We need to talk to him. <laughs> What's that? Or, or in a group setting, you say that, and then someone else in the group, oh, my husband, he's, he's great, he does everything. Praise God, he's a godly man. Because nobody's listening. I see this all the time in groups. It's like, let's stay at the content and try to outdo each other's godliness. Yes. It's all a bunch of lies. 90% of the time, bro. I'm not saying that. I'm keeping my mouth shut. Why would I share? Nobody's listening to the feeling. It's not about the house tours and it's how she's irritated here. Or what if she said it? It's also how you say it. I just said it in an irritating way. What if I said it this way? When I get home, and evening, my house, oh, it's a mess, and oh, the kids are just, they're just dirty, and my husband doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really care about dinner. I just, I, you know, I just, oh, I'm so tired. I don't know, I didn't say tired, but I, I just don't want to go home at all sometimes. That tone, what am I saying? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. That's different than you're irritated. So listen to the inflection, the tone, try to get to the feeling. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I know for a fact, this is going to be really hard, because I know Christians in this kind of a setting, to really say feelings is hard. So if you can't role play a real story, make up one. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Make up one, if you can't, right? Something that you might hear in your group, right? Okay, go.
no half past, half past ten thirty. Is this thing recording? Is it plugged in? Is that what you want to do? That's what this is right here. Yeah. You can probably stop this though. No, 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 it's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it right now just because it's the break. The, the... Okay. By just a show of hands, was getting to the feelings harder than some of the other ones? Or easier? How many thought it was harder? Okay, good. How many thought it was easier? Awesome! Okay, good, good, good. That's excellent. Now, we got an example here. Good old Alex and Ike. I had to pick on some of them because it's all the women right now. Um, and here's what Okay, this is very, um, very common. Okay, and we're gonna show you what can happen. I start to tell a story about, was it lung cancer? So, I actually made up the, um, the story. So, I, 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 I appeared to, um, to be very angry. Um, I'd done everything correct in my life, never smoked, never drank, you know, being a good family man and I went to see my doctor to look at my scans and he basically tells me that, uh, you know, I have a tumor in my lungs and um, I'm supposed to get a biopsy done, he thinks it's lung cancer, so, um, I mean, I have anger accepting everything and that was basically the, the rule I adopted. And then he... Okay, I got got that. He's in everything right in his life. Everything he has never smoked. And he's got lung cancer. Okay, so Alex is listening, and I said, "How'd it go, Alex?" And he he said he was uh, what was the word you used? That's an excellent word. You shut down. Shut down. It was hit with a sledgehammer. He was hit with a sledgehammer and he shut down. Okay, when those are the feelings that you can't get, you know, you don't know. It's not a deer in the headlights per se. It's different. Because a deer in a head, not that I've seen a deer in the headlights, but <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. Why don't we just say a dolphin in the water? <laughs> you know, that is a kind of, con you're just kind of like, okay, you're, you're kind of, you know, you know you need to do something, you're not quite sure, though, right? It's a kind of kind of thing. When you feel shut down, that's an emotion, that's more emotional feeling. So the reason he was shut down was because right now he's dealing with his grandmother, stage four lung cancer. What are the odds? Very high. Very high. When you step out, and this is another thing I didn't really want to say because I know way a Nazi wants to recruit you, but I'm going to tell you right now, when you get into ministry, when you're getting into messy life stuff, Your stuff gets messy too. And that's incredible. You made that story up, right? And look who his partner was. That's God. Because that shutdown feeling for you, my friend, that's normal. That's the beginning stages of the grief. Okay? And I know you love your grandma. And that example that you gave, Ike, I hear that a million times. And here's how it goes I followed Jesus. I love Jesus. I did this. I did that. I did this. I did that. And boom. There are no guarantees. And to follow Jesus means we follow him in a very what, broken world with our own brokenness. There are no guarantees. Right? And so you have to work through some of that anger. And guess what? <laughs> this is the fun part. God, he can handle your anger. I'm not sure your group can. <laughs> your group can't handle it, probably. But you as a leader better be able to handle handle anger at God. Do you understand? And sit there with it. And let the person be angry. God can handle it. As a matter of fact, God knows how angry you are. He wants you to come to him anyway, right? But what tends to happen in church groups is, shut down the anger, can't be angry at God. We don't love God. It's all fake. God knows you're pretty angry. 
And when you start to unpack that from a theological perspective, it's a wrong understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. And it doesn't take into account what I talked about, about living in a broken world. I've counseled a woman who loved God and her daughter was raped and murdered. Okay? And you have stories like that, right? Is God still good? Yes, he is. Is God present in that brokenness? Yes, he is. Yeah, in the back. What do you do when the story that she was sharing with me, I mean, I, I felt bad for her, but I wanted to fix her. I wanted to say, you know, why you didn't have to, and why are you, and how do you get... Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. The quick fix and the whys and all that, when it comes to the power of groups and the power of what I believe is the Holy Spirit working through groups, is that you can't fix it. What the what, what I teach in grad school, and this is a secular research shows this. Okay, so just think about the power of putting the research that shows what group does with the Holy Spirit in the group. The power is incredible. Group in and of itself, with no God involved at all, helps people find healing. It just does, for many reasons, which I'll talk about next time. But when you put the Holy Spirit there and say, okay, Lord, I don't have an answer for this. I don't have a quick fix, but I'm here. There's a thing called universality, which says, wow, you hurt, I hurt, we all hurt. But God's in the, mid mid in the middle of that hurt. That's the power of the healing. When you feel that you have to fix it, you are, I had a friend of mine, my mentor used to say, oh, so now you're wearing your um, Holy Spirit badge, are you? I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't fix it. I can't fix it. I don't even know what fix it means. Because maybe what God is allowing in your life is for a reason. I mean, Paul had something that he wanted fixed, and then get fixed. <laughs> And he was made what? More powerful in his weakness. Right? I mean, Jesus, read the chapter. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. We are comforted by the comfort we receive by the Holy Spirit. It does not say that the pain goes away. Read it. One of my favorite verses does not say that it goes away. Some things can't be fixed. You did drugs as a young kid and now you got brain damage? I can't be fixed. Now, does God sometimes miraculously heal? Yeah. But a lot of times it doesn't happen. So that fix it is we all want to, we want to fix. We don't want to see people in pain. Here, here's, here's another tidbit. I'm just giving you my tidbits here. When people come to counseling, I want to fix it and get happy again and all that. Well, I can't guarantee you that. And sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. And what does better look like? I don't know. I know what you think it looks like. I don't know what your Holy Father in Heaven thinks. Yeah? The power of groups to help heal is incredible. As a matter of fact, I say it when I teach group class. Were you in my group class? No. You were in my class. What I used to say in my class all the time is you have to trust the process of the group, even more trusting when you have the Holy Spirit there, that things work out as God intends it. You understand? And it may not look like you think it needs to look. God knows. But gosh, I want to be at the end of my life able to say, God, I trusted you most of the time. <laughs> I try. And then the times that I didn't trust you, you got to knock me upside my head and make you trust me more. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's that ultimate, do I really? And this is the question you got to grapple with. Do I really, really believe that he is sovereign? That through his hands... Whatever he's allowed into my life is because he loves me. You think I wanted my nephew to die? You think my sister's her only child? And I'm going to tell you, when he came back with that tumor again, my sister thought he had been healed. She thought he was healed. I, me and my husband had to walk alongside that knowing that 95% of the tumor gone still leaves 5% in the brain, which means it's not all gone, right? And the day he came out of the, the um, surgery, you know what my sister did? Scream.
screaming, screaming in the intensive care. Where is God? And all I could do was hold her and sob. And that boy, I had to be able to say, God knows. I don't get it. Some of you have that feeling of your own child, don't you? Or a spouse or whatever. Loss is probably the big one. Because on the one hand, we rejoice because he's in heaven, right? Yeah, but he's not here. I'm sorry. And that pain is pain. Or the, the pain of a divorce. You know? That quick fix mentality, we're not God. And sometimes in the midst of that pain is where God gets his greatest glory. And if you don't believe that to the core of your soul, I'm going to challenge you that by God putting you in this ministry, you're going to come out believing it. <laughs> you're going to walk it through. But you know what? That's the kind of faith that the world is looking for. They're not looking for everything is easy street because they know it's not true. Millionaires have lost a lot of money in the economy lately. You know, stuff's happened. I'm just preaching at you right now. <laughs> I'm so glad you're being honest because that fix-it mentality will get in the way. Nine times out of ten, church groups, oh gosh, edit this out too. <laughs> Oh, I'm in trouble. Um, they shut people down when they're hurting. And then people go elsewhere. To the bar, where the bartender says, hey, I got you, I hear you, you want another one? Or to their friends, or whatever, because we're not real, we're not real. It's not great all the time. I just totally got off track. Okay, let's, you know what, let's go ahead and take a little break, and uh, we'll be back. Okay. Ten minute break. Okay, we'll be back by ten thirty. Or so. Don't don't write any letters, commentaries to the. Okay. All right. right, all right. So yeah. video. Oh, read now. The video's coming. Go. Doug and Sharon David Smith. We've uh, been given a chance to start our own life group tonight here at home. I'm scared. I don't know what they're going to ask me, and I'm just a little bit nervous right now. Starting at 4 a.m., we've been doing drills. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're working just on skills, linguistic skills. Red mother yellow, red mother yellow, red mother yellow. We put together some flow charts. Uh, we created a constitution, like a bill of rights for our life. 17 pounds of hamburger might be too much. We have pants on a log to feed 800. All right, so come to the door, you say. Be right there. Okay, but when you call, I don't do it in the British. <laughs> Look at this. These are, these are all sugary treats. We can't give them sugary treats. Our bodies are our temples. And we don't put sugary treats. Are these push pops? Ooh. Uh, there was like a lot of PowerPoint presentation. We, we tried to get some active videos in there. I'm not quite sure if the video of mittens in there will be acceptable for all. I know there's a lot of cat lovers. But I'm worried about the people who aren't, so I may have to take that one out. But Sharon then, is working on dialing down the cat videos. Worship is going to be absolutely spectacular. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> That's Proverbs. Ding dong. Be right there. That's what you say while I run and I grab a warm apple crisp and a tall iced tea. So hopefully everything will go according to plan. We made ourselves some number one life related t shirts tonight, so we're all going to put them on as soon as everyone leaves. <sighs> Be that just a moment. You were British. That was British. <laughs> We're British tonight.
where the listener tries to gather together what's already been said, make sure that the speaker has been understood correctly, and prepare the speaker to move on. Okay. It's really kind of putting together a group of reflections. Now, notice this line, the speaker has been understood. Theoretically, you think they've been understood, right? Because you've been listening. But I'm here to tell you, a lot of times, they're not understood. Because most often when someone's talking and we're listening, without meaning to, our minds are going to what our response is going to be, right? Okay? And so you're not really listening at that point. So summarizing will help in clarifying, have you really been listening, basically? Okay? And so you're putting together a group of reflections. All right? Now what this does to the person is it helps them focus what's been happening. So now let's put your mind in the group, okay? You're running the group, and so the, the tool of summarizing what's been happening in the group is very powerful because you're able to kind of pull it all together and help the group see what, what, what we've been talking about. It confirms whatever the person has been speaking or people that have been speaking have uh, been saying, and you, you begin to focus on the existence of other people in the group as you summarize. Because see, summarizing, you're able to bring other people in and say, what I what I heard, we're talking group now, right now we're just doing individuals, right? But in the group, you're like, what a, you know, we've been talking about this, right? And you're you're kind of summarizing it all, and you can have other people help you summarize. Okay? You want to pick people in your group, and we'll talk about this next week, but people in your group who are really good at listening and helping you. Because it's hard when you're the only one listening, right? But remember, you're modeling the behavior, so you want to see in the group who else is listening. You don't ask someone to help you summarize in the group when they've been fiddling on their uh, iPhone. Because they're not listening, right? So you're looking around. Who's got that posture of an attending, listening? That's what's going to help you in the group setting, okay? And you, like you said, clarify what they mean, and you realize that the listener understands, okay? All right, so now, here's an example. I don't know. I think you can read it there, but I'm going to, okay, here's the summarizing, okay. We discussed your relationship with your husband. You said there were conflicts right from the start related to the way money was handled and that he often felt you gave more importance to your friends. Yet on the whole, things went well and you were quite happy until three years ago. Then the conflicts became more frequent and more intense so much so that he left you twice and talked to divorce. This, uh, this was also the time when your drinking was at its peak. Have I understood the situation properly? Okay? And that's long, right? But you, you're, you're kind of tying together everything you've been listening, and then the wonderful line at the end is, have I understood this correctly? Okay? Because you're giving the opportunity for them to say, well, yeah, but, no, maybe, I'm not sure you heard that, and then what do they do? Then they say it again, and then you summarize it again, okay? Remember, the whole goal is to put it all together, not how response for that, is to pull it all together, okay? You ready? The same, the same people working together, the same story, or you can change it, try to summarize it. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes on this one. It's a little bit longer, okay? All right, go.
Okay, now, let me... I have a really good question. I'm trying to explain this. Okay, what I did for this course is I took a combination of two classes in graduate school. By the way, if any of you are thinking of going back to grad school, I highly recommend Trinity. <laughs> you know, thank you, thank you. Uh, side note, which I'll talk about more at the very end in two weeks, Trinity is opening a Miami-Dade Kendall campus in the fall. Both undergraduate and graduate courses. So, oops, to press the button there. Anyway, uh, that's a commercial, and I, I can talk to you more too. It's not, I don't even know if I was supposed to say that because it's kind of quiet. <laughs> We've signed the papers, and they're going to be building it out for the fall. Anyway, uh, if any of this interests you, okay, long term. Um, here's the thing. What I took was a graduate course in group therapy. I'm taking stuff from there, and I'm taking things from a graduate course in skills, counting skills. It's kind of hard to do because I'm trying to condense it all, so put it all together. So the examples I'm giving you are from one-to-one -one interactions, okay? But that's kind of the basic. you got to be able to one-to-one. -one. Now, to do that one-to-one -one in a group is a little more complex, okay? So what the question was, was if it's a lot in the summary, should you write it down and how do you, you know, okay. If you're doing one to one, you, you, you can do that. You can interact, but you're not doing that. You're doing a group. So what you want to be able to do, and this is this is hard. We're going to try and teach you that. Okay, next week is you're connecting the dots because here's here's what you got to understand. Groups do not happen by accident. The topics that are brought up because of the principle of universality, everybody in that group is kind of going through similar things. So as you summarize, what you want to do is is say. Okay, so your husband was really pretty good, but now, is anybody else? And then you're kind of looking around the room, you're scanning the room, and someone else will say, yeah, and I remember when you said this, and you're the one, you're like the director of the movie, tying the things together, you understand? So as you summarize what this person just said, say, then you, you know, this happens over time, it doesn't happen in the first group you meet, usually. You remember, ah, so-and-so had a similar thing, and then you bring that out, and then your other people will help you with the summary of what they just said. Has anybody seen that happen in groups they've been in? So I see some of you nodding your heads, okay? And chances are you had no training, and the person leading the group was a lay leader, which is fantastic, and it happened because groups have a life of their own, and they go through a procedure. They all do regardless, okay? The only thing a graduate degree does is helps you see the procedure and understand it. And so we're giving you those little tidbits here. Now, just because we're doing this training now doesn't mean we're never going to help you again. I don't know what it's going to look like, but there'll be follow-up helpfulness, you know, uh, down the road if you have some problems or whatever. We haven't totally talked that through, but it's not, we're not just leaving you off and never helping you again, okay? I don't want you, plus the counseling center's right here. You can call me. I'll give you my cell number. I can't believe I just said that either. Um, no, I know really, if you're stuck or something, but, but know this, and this is the beauty of it, and, and I know that, that that was a cute video because they're all nervous about God's in control. And that group process trusts the process. Trust that God's going to move it. So if you can't remember everything about summarizing, remember one thing. Probably someone else in the room remembers it. You see, and then you kind of, you read the group as best you can, and you go with the non-verbal, okay, which we'll, we'll talk more about uh, next week. Any other question about summarizing? Anything else? Easier or harder than reflecting feelings? Harder? Harder? Easier? Anybody easier? Okay, okay. All right, remember, we're thinking, feeling, and acting. Those of you that found feeling easier, you're in the feeling you're a little stronger in that area. Those of you that did the summarizing, you're a little stronger in the cognitive area. That's okay. God in his brilliance is giving you certain strengths. And every group is going to have someone on the opposite side of your weakness. Ah, isn't that cool? That's the other thing I want to make, make sure that I mention. Um, you want to, some of you want to lead the group and you're single and you're going to lead it by yourself. Highly recommend that you don't, that you get a co-leader. That you do it together. Because there's so much stuff happening and if you have someone else, they can help you. So when you're talking, they're kind of observing and, and, and jumping in, okay?
Anything else? Question? Anything? Okay. Let's move on to I think we're on, we're on processing. Let's say, yeah, processing. Okay. Okay. Now, this is where you are taking a step back and you're in the mode of what, of what you're listening to, but you're thinking, remember the thinking part of you, about your observations about the speaker and what they've communicated. That's called processing. Okay? Most of our lives is lived in the content. You talk content. Process is what's going on underneath. Okay? Is the way the person talks, what you're getting from the conversation, the nonverbal. Okay? So this is a little bit harder. This is going to be a lot harder. Okay? Um, but you'll get good at it as you do, do the, the groups. Okay? What you're doing is you are mentally kind of cataloging what they believe, their knowledge, their attitudes. It's really information by how they interact in the group. And it's your observations. Okay? This is the real power of the group as a leader because you're noticing, and I'm going to take this group right here, that every time you're in a group, this one right here, Lionel, right? Lionel, he starts talking, and all of a sudden, his wife kind of shuts down. And Leroy shuts down too. She shuts down. Everybody's shutting down. And you're just listening. And you should be thinking to yourself as you process, hmm, every time Lionel talks, he talks a lot. <laughs> Lionel, good stuff, I know. Lionel and I, we, we talked already. But what's going on? He's not even noticing that the rest of the group is shutting up, but you're noticing it. That's processing. And what you're observing is that he's controlling the group. And nobody wants to hear him anymore. But nobody is about to say anything because this is a church group and we're not allowed to confront anybody because God forbid they leave. <laughs> right? Okay, so what I'm saying is you're in the middle of the conversation and you're noticing, you're still listening, but you're observing the process. Okay? Easier said than done. Okay? But in a group setting, that's what you're going to be doing, right? Now, we're going to change it up a little bit this time. We're not going to do responding, we're going to do processing. We're going to have a group now. Your group is a group. You're not doing an individual. Okay? This whole group, I don't work, uh, and my helpers are going to walk around. And someone, just role play, just someone bring something up, and one of you be the leader and try to observe the process. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just make it up as you go along. One of you try to be the leader and observe the process. And then we'll talk about it after we do it, okay?
everything shut down. So his question was, well, how do I, you know, get everybody else involved? Well, it's that's that processing. You're observing, then you're summarizing. You say, you look at this is what I do, and, and, and you know, this takes. You don't do this overnight, so don't think you're going to do it right away. But you start to look at the group and say, okay, who's giving me eye contact? Who's looking at me, but also looking at her as if, oh, gosh, I, I can relate to that. And that's what you do. You you say, Carmen, that was really really good. I mean, is there anybody else who's kind of, um, Deborah, how about you? That's how you do it. And then guess what happens? This one a little while later and then that one. But sometimes people need the encouragement to speak, right? But he knew because he was processing. Okay? And in a group, it's harder to process than an individual because there's so many people. Okay? But okay, so we're going to move on because we're going to run out of time. And the truth is, next week we're going to do more practice with group kind of stuff. What we're gonna to move to real quick now is gossiping in a group. Wow. No, I like that. I heard a little, mmm, amen, let's gossip, all right. Okay, let's do gossip real quick, okay. Okay, so you got a group, ready? And you find out, shh, you find out that there has been some gossiping. It was clothed in a prayer request. Please pray for mine. You no good husband. <laughs> I don't think he's having an affair. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So, what do you do in a regroup? Okay, when that happens, well, you bring it out in the open without using names. You don't have to. You just say, you know what's come to my attention? There's, there's been some gossiping. And you remind everybody about the rule. Okay, by bringing it up, you, the group members can then air their feelings and change their behaviors. You don't have to say who it is. You may not know who it is. You just heard, you know, that the 9 o'clock service, that, you know, 12 o'clock, you heard whatever. You don't, don't worry about it. Just say, let's talk about this rule about never gossiping. How y'all feel about that? And then just let it let it ride because people are going to bring it up or we're going to talk about it. Okay, so be careful that you don't automatically assume the worst of the worst. Okay, because you know when I say gossiping, we automatically think the worst of the worst. But the gossiping could have been that, and I've had this happen. You're sitting in a bathroom stall, and <laughs> and you hear in what was a whispering. You know, comment that sounds like the wife left them. And you just happen to hear it, you know? And so it wasn't that that person was telling you the gossip per se, but they were sharing it. And maybe it really was prayer request, okay? Okay? So it really wasn't a demeaning thing. It just kind of came out, right? So what you want to do is find out the specific and to handle every situation differently. If it's someone who's a real gossip, then you got to deal with it directly, right? Individually. Um, and then you're constantly disturbed, you have to talk to that person in private, okay? You, you take them aside and you, and you talk to them, okay? It's, the goal is for the people to stop the negative talk and let, focus on the well-being of the group. Using good judgment, it will work out. Remember, the group is a living organism. Mm -hmm. And if it's fed by gossip and negativity, it will die, and groups do die. Right? So you gotta make sure that you, uh, you deal with that head on. Okay? All right. Um, which brings me to conflict. Okay? We're gonna talk a lot more about this next time. But um, conflict needs to be recognized, discussed, and resolved. Okay? There's a thing called the big elephant in the room, in the group, and nobody wants to deal with it. Right? Well, that, that's not gonna help people grow emotionally or spiritually for that matter. So you got to be able to talk about it. And I've got some verses here um, that we want to look at. But, um, you know, a lying tongue, as it should, innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans and feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. Um, not good. And we tend to err as Christians on well, you know, just let it go, it's okay. And I'm here to tell you, it will destroy a group. 
don't destroy the root. And sometimes the most powerful, healthy thing spiritually is to say, you know what, maybe you shouldn't be in this group. God forbid we ask someone not to be in a group. That's the way it goes. Because if you can't keep the rule of no gossip, then you, you're not going to have a group. So you might as well, you know, deal with it right away, okay? All right, we're going to move on, and this is for the sake of time, because I want to make sure we have time. Um, oh, here's another thing. It doesn't have to be lies. Even the truth can hurt when it's in secret, right? It doesn't have to be lies that people are saying about you. It can just be the truth, okay? And no one likes to be talked about, right? Okay. Let's go to confidentiality, and then we'll talk about suicide. Okay. Notice at the bottom, developing trust in groups through confidentiality. How do you build that is by this rule that says, everything that says it is said in here stays in here. Okay? What is said in here stays in here. Now, there are a few times that that needs to be broken. Okay? And... You all know what those are, right? Tell me. Hurts themselves or hurts someone else. Exactly. Okay. But in order to act on that, breaking that rule as a leader, okay, you need to be sure that everybody knows in advance that that may be broken. Okay. So the reason that you need to let everybody know is because when it is broken, then the trust level in the group is going to go down. Right? Because you had to break it. And so you need to be prepared to talk about why that had to be broken. All right? Now, I know that some of these groups are going to be open groups and some are going to be closed groups. What's, what's the difference? Anybody know? Open meaning anybody come in anytime, right? Closed is we're starting, it's going to be so many weeks, it's only these eight people. Okay? If it's a closed group, confidentiality is set at the beginning and maybe a couple of times, but then you don't have to bring it up every week, trust me. Confidentiality is much, I'm going to tell you right now, much stronger in a closed group. It just is. So as you think about the kind of groups you want to lead, you need to think about that, okay? Closed groups have confidentiality much stronger and, and gossip is also less of an issue because you have a beginning and you have an end and you have the same people, okay? If you have an open group, then you need to be able to say this about confidentiality, to tell what confidentiality is, means what we say here stays here, and you have to say it over and over and over and over again, every, almost every time you meet. Because there's going to be new people there that they don't know. Okay, so you need to be able to say that. Um, okay. Um, yeah, that's what this went over. Okay. All right, so a group member poses a danger themselves, okay? Um, we'll talk about suicide in a little bit. So you have to break confidentiality at that point. Whatever, you know, many people say it many different ways, okay? But if, that, if something comes up in a group, you just can't keep that to yourself. You have to talk to somebody. I would say immediately call Wayne and Nazi and talk to them, and they need me to help consult with it, we can do that. Now, if the person is actually saying, I'm going to hurt myself now, we'll talk about that in a minute, but suicide, you, you do something right away, okay? If you believe uh, under the age of 16, I'd say higher, you know, I'd say a little bit higher, 17 as well, has been the victim of incest, rape, child abuse, or some other noted crime, you need to automatically break confidentiality. Automatically, okay? Um, uh, that the person needs special help, of some kind of elderly, for example, right? And they are being treated or not treated well by the people caring for them, you break it then as well. Okay, and then of course, if you get a subpoena, I don't, I don't expect that with y'all, but you know, you never know. Okay? Questions about breaking those specific uh, times to break confidentiality? We're all clear on that? Is it easy to break confidentiality? Where I inadvertently mentioned a person's occupation in the group, uh, thinking it was not a big deal. You know, I mean, I really knew that. And that person never came back. Yeah. Felt unsafe. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's not bringing in confidentiality, but we're talking exactly, but I understand that. Yeah, you want to be careful. But um, here, here's the, the flip side of breaking confidentiality, and you, you, the therapist people know. You know you have to do it. It's the right thing to do. It's harder said than done. Yeah. Much harder. Because you know when you pick up that phone to call DCF to say, uh, this is what was said, that you have set into motion all kinds of things. It's the right thing to do, and you have to do it, okay? For the sake of that person, okay? But you don't know how it's gonna end up. And then, back to the group setting, you now have violated, you know, the confidentiality. That's why it needs to be talked about. And everybody should be aware of that, yeah. Um, is there gonna be a, I guess, a structure to follow here, a pool we go to, or who should be notified? Yeah, we'll, we'll come up with that. <laughs> we will. We'll come up with it. Yeah. I'll talk about suicide in a minute. Suicide is probably the big one, and we'll make sure we clarify that. But yeah, you got to... Um, one thing I love about Christ Fellowship is they're very clear. I mean, the, the, the workers all get fingerprinted, the whole thing, and there is a structure to follow. We're going to we'll have some kind of structure. Okay? Um, okay, so... Uh, Okay, it's closing. Keep going here. Okay. Now this is more about when you're making a call. We keep going here. Okay, I have a yeah. question. What do you recommend? I guess depending on what you're bringing, what you're speaking of, do you also inform them that you're going to Yeah. Do? Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, some of the touchy ones are things like, well, let me just throw this out. They're in a group and they're really. Um, it's a mom, I'll make up a story here, it's a mom, and she's really trying to, you know, not drink, and she's been coming to group, and she's doing great, but she's had some issues lately, and you know that she's driving, and she picks up her kids from school every day, and you told her, the group has confronted her, and said, you really, you know she's drinking when she's driving, at some point, you need to call it in. And this is, oh, but Dr. Stone, oh, you know, you're really great and confident. Yeah, you're going to hurt them. I go, you know what? When they're acting out like that, they want you to call it in. And you know what? You do not want to be on the other side of getting that phone call or seeing in the newspaper that there was a trash, a, a crash, and it was because she was drinking. But I'm telling you, I mean, my therapist friends can tell you, it's harder than you think. Because you get all these mixed emotions and I'm breaking off from the She's going to lose the kids and they're going to go to DCF and they're going to be in a foster home and they're going to run away from a foster home. They're going to end up as human trafficking victims and everything's going to be awful. Really? That's where your mind goes. And I'm not saying DCF is great. They got their issues. But you know what? I don't want to be the one who didn't call it in and the kid's dead. Sorry. I, I can't. I, ethically, professionally, I can't. But as a leader, you can't either. Okay? Because you don't know. Worst case scenario, they end up in foster care. But nine times out of ten, DCF don't do a whole lot. I hate to tell you. They don't do a whole lot. I mean, really. But you know what happens is she gets put on notice, and there's more things that come to bear on her as far as governmental things to say, oh, no, you have to go to this, you may have to go to, you know, different things that you have to do for the court, which ultimately protects who? Who's the victim? Children. Kids. The kids, okay, all right. Uh, okay, let me let me keep on going here. Okay, let's do. I think we're ready for suicide. Favorite okay, topic. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I want to thank Miss Isabel for helping me with this slide, my dear. Um, one million people die each year from suicide, according to World Health Organization. I'm going to go through some of you guys. Anybody here, just by show of hands, know someone who committed suicide? Wow. Whoa. Holy cow. That's a lot. Wow. And I bet there's no, I bet that's not a coincidence that you want to do these years. Because you've, you've known someone who's really taking it to the final step. Okay. Good. People who talk about it won't really do it. It's not true. People usually do talk about it. Okay? They've always given a clue or warning, so don't ignore it. Here's my favorite. They just want attention. Well, 
That's a pretty drastic way to get attention, don't you think? And, and what you sometimes do is you do something that quote unquote is for attention and you accidentally slip and you die. The end result is death, right? These kind of statements, I can't see any way out, I'd be better off dead, you know, all that, even if they're joking, it may indicate very serious um, thoughts. Um, I'm a big Miami Dolphin fan. Anybody else Miami Dolphin fan? Yeah. Okay, just for your entertainment reading. Not that you don't have anything else to do. Go home and read the Martin Report about Jonathan Martin. Just read it. It's 144 pages. Won't take you long. I was reading it this morning at 3 o'clock when my dog woke me up. I couldn't go back to sleep, so I read the report. Oh my goodness, so sad. That young man, suicide, two times thought of suicide because he was being bullied. I'm not here in the, we're not debating what happens in the football locker room, I don't care. That guy was suicidal and he was hurting, okay? And even joking and stuff that people do, you know? And uh, I just heard this morning that, uh, what's his name, Incognito put a tweet out that said that he's a friend, but he's a bully, but what you need to do is read the National Hotline for Suicide Prevention. How dare he? How dare he? Basically what he's saying is, this guy, Jonathan Martin, was screwed up and was suicidal. So it wasn't my bullying. I mean, truly, off the wall. I, I, I think you need to read it, because you need to see how the mentality of someone who's being picked on and picked on and how they keep it inside, and how when you're in that much pain, suicide is an option. It is. Anyone who tries to kill himself must be crazy. The definition of crazy means psychotic or insane. Not true. Not true at all. They are usually people who are depressed. I'm going to talk about that. They're grief stricken, and they're in despair. They're in a lot of pain. A lot of pain. Um, if they're determined to kill themselves, nothing is going to stop them. That's a myth. That's false. Even the most severely depressed person has mixed feelings. They have, it's it's this, this internal conflict. They want, here's what they want. They want the pain to stop. And this is the only way they think the pain will stop. Okay? Um, how many of you heard of, I don't know his name, California, Rick Warren. Give yeah. something else to read and listen. Did anybody see this series of sermons after his son committed suicide? Get it. Watch it. Very powerful. Very powerful. And what you find from that, and also him and his wife did a CNN interview with Pierce Morgan, I think. Um, they dealt with his suicidal ideation for years. Okay? Now, I don't know anybody who wouldn't say that Rick Warren loves God. Do you? Of course he does. And the reality is, as from that, what's going to come out of that pain is the, the whole church, all of Saddleback's, their new initiative, you know, they did AIDS in Africa. You know what their new initiative is? You ready for this? Mental illness in the church. I love it. Make our business boom, right? <laughs> It is something people don't want to talk about. But he had so much pain, that was the only way he could end it. The only way he could end it. Um, okay, I want. They were unwilling to seek help. Not true. Uh, more than half looked for help six months prior to their death. Okay, so, it, in other words, it's not coming out of the blue. They're, they're kind of, it's like someone in the ocean asking for help, but people are like, just walk on by or, minimize it or, you know, we, we have to be very careful that we think that they don't really want help. Um, this is a big one, and this is important for your group. Talking about it is going to give you the idea to do it. You do not ever give a suicidal person ideas of how to do it when they're talking about it. They've already thought it through, okay? So the opposite is what you have to do, <laughs> is you bring up the subject, and you discuss it openly, that is the most helpful thing you can do. But how do you feel in doing that? How do you think you would feel? 
nervous, scared to death. Those are the, the right terms, okay? Because once they start talking, now talk about deer in the headlights. I think at that point you get deer in the headlights and total shutdown all at once, okay? Because they're talking and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, how do you, what do I, it's scary. But you've got to let them talk. That is the worst thing you can do is to shut them down. The worst thing you can do is say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. Do you know that if you commit suicide, you're not going to heaven? I've heard that. You have to let them talk. Okay? Now, if you're doing this in a group, how do you think the group members are going to feel? The same as you? Right? And they're going to want to shut them down. Right? So how do you stop that? How do you stop it? Get the group involved. Get the group involved, right? And you have to model it, don't you? You have to model that it's okay to talk about that. And, and here's the other the principle we'll talk about next week a lot. The universality principle. If someone is talking about, I just don't want to live in this pain anymore, I don't want, chances are there's someone else in the group, if you trust God and the sovereignty and putting a group together, there's someone else in the group who's been there, done that, felt that way. Okay? Maybe not to that extreme, but they have felt hopeless. Right? So you get the group to kind of help you, but you have to be the one that's okay with that person talking about it. Okay? Okay. Some of the warning signs, talking about it, talking or writing a lot about death or dying, uh, looking for things that can be used, weapons, drugs, things like that. Now, if the person has some of these signs, but they also have what we call in psychology and counseling a mood disorder, um, and these are the, the top top ones. Okay, we'll talk about this more in the next couple weeks. But depression, bipolar, or alcohol dependence, or has previously attempted suicide, or has a family history of suicide. Any of those, you know, then the, we're going to look at some of the high risk factors. Your mind should automatically go, okay, this is really serious, okay? Because when you have the mood disorders here, depression or bipolar, you have um, that hopeless feeling that physiologically, they can't even sometimes get out of bed, things like that, that's going to really kick in. The alcohol is a problem because that lowers inhibitions, right? So a person has less inhibitions about doing what they're going to do. And then um, if they previously attempted, that's huge. That's huge. So I, I don't know if you have a setup yet. Uh, we, we, we might want to talk about it. But as you get people in the groups, if there's anybody that you know has any kind of previous history, you want to make sure you flag that. I don't know how you're going to do that necessarily, but if it comes up maybe in the interview process or something, you might want to do that because that's a high-risk person, very high-risk. Uh, and of course, family history. Um, this, this, this idea of hopelessness, okay? So you got someone who may have some kind of mood disorder, maybe using alcohol, has had a previous attempt, and then of course the issue of hopelessness. Um, you know, just a bleak future, there, there's really no hope, that's part of it. And as I'm talking, those of you that have someone, know someone who can suicide, does this ring true from the person that you knew? Yeah. Anybody? What were the what were the signs? Did you see? Do you see any signs now? Definitely, you know, the person is helpless. I mean, they, they have no hope. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Don't want to yeah. Move on. Yeah. I had a friend who committed suicide in uh, August this past year. He was a acquaintance kind of friend who came to me uh, about maybe a year and a half ago. Is amazing, and, and he had a very severe sexual abuse past as a man. He was 60 something years of age. And he came, and the power, see, this is, it was, he was incredible. He came, he came to talk to me because he heard that we were doing work uh, with human trafficking, girls that have been trafficking, and he was concerned that we didn't know uh, therapeutically the best way to do it research wise. And so he came 
out of concern that we not mess it up, which I thought was wonderful. And I said, please sit. Let me tell you our background and what we're doing. And, and he was ecstatic. And as a result of that conversation, it's a year and a half ago when I met him, he said, I want you to meet the director of Christie House. You know Christie House? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Christie House is the place in the county for helping sexual abuse victims and human trafficking. He introduced me to her. He not only introduced me, he was on our board. He not only introduced me to her, and he's a believer, okay? He introduced me to her and we hit it off. And from that relationship came Christy House training some of my therapists for free, just awesome stuff. And really a secular agency trusting a Christian agency to walk together and helping these girls, right? It was awesome. And then I saw him a few times. He was just great, always smiling, saying that when we used to have a choir, he would sing, awesome guy. I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. And I uh, knew he was dating someone. He's, he's older. He was in his, I don't want to say, late 60s. And I, I get a phone call that he killed himself. I was, are you kidding me? I was shocked. What I did know was he had a very severe sexual abuse past. He was depressed. He loved Jesus, but I didn't realize, you know. Now, I, it was really hard. It was hard to hear that, but when I look back, he fit all the criteria that I'm going to go over in a minute as a very high risk, okay? Um, so don't think that someone who is being used by God and is involved in church and doing stuff wouldn't see that as an answer because he had so much pain. And this is a guy who had worked on his sexual abuse past. He had worked on it. What he never really allowed himself to work on, and I'll share this with you, is his depression. He never wanted to take medication. Wow. Now, I didn't know at the time, but now I know why, because he was drinking. He was self-medicating. So instead of going and getting medication, he was drinking, which all lowered his inhibitions, and he hung himself. So what should you do? Be yourself. Um, the words aren't as important as being present. One of the things we talked about, listening. Your voice and manner will show it. Uh, listen. They're usually just trying to unload their despair. Be sympathetic. Non-judgmental. Offer hope. Hope that if they get help, the hopelessness will dissipate. But they gotta get help, okay? They have to get help. Now, this is the hard part in a group. Someone says, I'm very depressed, I'm having, I can't go on. What's another passive way of saying it? I don't want to live anymore, it's not worth it. Then the next question from the group leader immediately needs to be, are you having thoughts of suicide? Oh, are you kidding me? I'm not saying that. I'm giving them the idea. What did I just say? You don't give them the idea. So you hear these veiled kind of things, like I just don't want My kids would be better off without me. I'm drinking again. Or my kids would be better off without me because my husband is never going to pay and I just can't take care of them. Or I lost my job again. My kids can't even look at me in the face anymore. I'm worthless as a man, what's the point? The next comment out of your mouth as a leader should be, have you thought about suicide? Because if they have, they will tell you probably that they have. And if they haven't, don't mean, oh, no, 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 not to that point. Okay, so you, you didn't make a mistake. It was good. Okay, talk to me, you're all really quiet. We are really quiet right now. How hard would it be to say that to somebody? Scary? Yeah, it's very scary. It's very scary, but by doing that, you automatically, you're showing them your concern, and you're taking them seriously, and this is the big one. It's okay for them to share their pain with you. Okay? And that idea of empathy, that we didn't get to this time, we'll go next time, is the ability to feel, I mean, try to put yourself in their position about how bad it must be for that to be a thought, right? Because you want them to be able to tell you. And if you don't 
think it's okay to talk about it. They won't. They won't. And remember, if they're going to do it, they want to talk about it. Do you understand? So it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, I guess if we're in a group and they've opened up that much, yeah. then it's okay if they proceed or at some, or maybe should you ask that question if you feel like maybe in the group it's going to be really difficult for that to come out and do it privately? Like, have I, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this as if it's coming up in the group. And if it's coming up in the group, then they really trust the group. Okay? And you go for it as a group leader in the group. You don't have to take them aside. You, you just talk about there. Chances are someone else in the group is going to say, I've been there. I've been there. And maybe it's not you, but then you help the group, give them the support, and then you, you look at what can we do to get you the help that you need. And you do not keep that quiet. That is when you break confidentiality. And then you may get, you know, please don't tell my wife. I have to tell your wife. And let me, let me, okay, let me, let me just, this is the big, um, this is where a lot of pastors get in trouble. So they think that if they talk to somebody else, the person's never going to, I don't even know what they think about trust. They, I think pastors kind of, I'm married to a pastor, so I can say this. Okay? They kind of like to be liked. They want to be liked by everybody. you know. And so the thing is they're afraid if I tell someone else, breaking confidentiality, they're not going to like me. Well, it's the same thing that all of us feel when we have to break confidentiality. You might lose that connection, but you save a life. What's better? They're mad at you, don't ever want to talk to you, or you save their life. Okay? For therapists, the issue is that, oh, they're never going to come back to therapy, and it's over. Yep. Yep. And they feel really bad, and they come into supervision, like, uh, and we process, we process it. We say, you know what? We had to do it. So in the group, you take your words at, and you begin to check we're going to do it in a second. How serious is it? We're going to practice. Someone in the group is going to say, I just don't want to live anymore, and you all are going to practice it in your groups. Okay, not suicide, but talking. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes are not working because this is a very serious subject. Yes, I, okay, let me move on. Uh, yeah, don't, let me put it, don't argue with them. Oh, but you have so much to live for. No, 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 don't even try to go there, okay? Don't, even do that. Uh, don't act shocked. Let the value of human life. You know, don't, you don't, don't do any of that, okay? Um, or that it's wrong, or you know, you know that's the unpardonable sin. You're never going to get into heaven. Even if you pray the prayer, you're done. You're not going to heaven. If you kill yourself, don't do that because that's not going to get you anymore. You want to get them to talk about what they're feeling. And you don't promise confidentiality. So this, you're going to be sworn to secrecy to the group? No, you can't do that. Okay. Don't give them ways to fix the problem. Um, you can't fix it. Okay. Here's what you need to do. Okay. These are the questions. And what you're trying to do is assess how serious and how imminent the possibility of suicide is. Okay. So the first thing you do is after they say, I just don't live anymore, you say, okay. Um, do you have a plan? And here's an answer. Well, no, I'm not a what plan, but I just don't want to live anymore. Okay, in your mind, that is, it's a low risk, okay? But they say, yeah, I got a plan. And then the next question is, um, you have them tell you the plan. What's the plan? I would get in my car and drive off a Cuba scan bridge. I would go home and get my gun and blow my brains out, whatever, okay? You get them to tell you as much of the plan as possible in as specific a detail as possible. Okay, here's a hint. The more detail they have, the higher the danger. There's a difference between, oh, I go home and get a gun, and, you know, versus I would go home at around 3 o'clock because nobody's there, and I would go into the top floor, the third bathroom, and get the gun and the pot. That's serious thinking. So that's, again, higher, higher risk, right? And then, this is important, it's tied to the plan, is do you have the means to do it? You know, yes, I would get a gun. Then the next question as they're talking is, do you have a gun? No. Do you know where to get a gun? No, but my uncle has a gun, and I would get in the car, but they live in the Redlands, so I don't know that I could get You see, you're trying to tease out 
how much of the plan has been thought through, and how easy it is to get it. Okay? I would add something here that I do um, is um, how, uh, what's the word? how uh, lethal is it? Okay? Because in my mind, if someone says, I'm going to get the gun or hang myself, that's very lethal. Pills is less lethal, depending on the pills. And one of the things I learned in a disorder in a hospital in California, and I never knew this, you know what one of the most lethal pills to take is, and nobody knows it? Ready? Tylenol. Tylenol. You think it's just Tylenol? Who <laughs> just isn't Tylenol? Versus anything else, Tylenol is very lethal. So, you know, teenage kids, you just, you gotta be really careful with Tylenol. So if they're telling me, you know, pills versus a knife, you know, I just, I like that information, plus it gets them to talk more and more. Okay, so then, what, when would you do it? And then the big one, so are you gonna do it? And they say, oh, I've said too much. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do it. But they've told you all the details. Then you as a leader say, you know what? I just don't know that I can trust you right now. You gave me a lot of detail, and I can't let you leave. At that point, what I would say is you call 911, and you get the police to come, and they do an evaluation, and then it's out of your hands. And you call, it's called a big rack. And if the police come, and this, we've had this happen, and they talk to them, and the guy lies about everything, oh, I never said that, I never did that. Well, now you got a group that heard it, right? So it's a little bit easier. But I've seen the person act out and out lie, and the police take their word for it, not ours. And they don't take them in. You know what? I don't want to be held in that. They usually don't do that if you're a licensed pro professional. But some of our students, they've done that, and I've been, you know, whatever. It, 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 it's you did what you had to do, and it's in, on their head if this person does anything. Okay. All right. Um, so you call 911. Okay. Uh, skip this. Let me think here. I want to get to. Okay. Depra okay. These are some of the things that I mentioned already, but notice I wanted to add, make sure we talk about this one here, here. terminal illness or chronic pain. That's really big. Someone is terminally ill or have got unrelenting pain, chronic pain, that's another high risk, okay? You know, and then if they're a believer, they're like, why should I, what's the point? I'd rather just be with Jesus anyway. And, I mean, you can, at some level you can understand if they're in excruciating pain, but that's not, that's not the answer. A recent loss or stressful event, okay? You know, a divorce, all right? Or the death of a loved one, those kinds of things come in it. Again, social isolation and, and loneliness. And of course, uh, trauma or abuse. This friend of mine, uh, he had depression, drinking, which I did not know about. Uh, I don't think he had that or that. Recent event, he had just. This was the clincher. Because the, the person he was seeing had kind of broken up with him, so she was blaming herself. But you know what we found out? Three weeks before that, he lost his business. So it was more the business. Remember what I said? Yeah. And as we found out more, it was definitely the business. He lost his business. And he was a very well well to do that. So I mean it was like it all was everything was there. So Recent loss, and he was very lonely, and of course, this was good too. Okay. Mm, keep going here, I just want to get to the. Uh, here is this is what I want to show you. According to the research, you know, it's towards the end, and I'm going to take a few minutes to practice in the group. According to the research, this is what the higher, this is the high risk areas. By the way, men tend to complete suicide more, whereas women attempt more. You understand? So women try it, but they're not as good as succeeding. <laughs> better, better. They may not try it as much, but when they try, they do it. Okay? So um, age, under 20, so those teenage years, very high level of susceptibility to suicide, suicidation, um, or over 44, towards the end of life. Well, that's not the end of life. <laughs> Begins at 15. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, later on in life, whatever. Uh, uh, depression. Okay. There's depression. If there was a previous suicide attempt, alcohol. This is interesting. Rational thinking loss. 
this Martin kid on the Dolphins team, when you read the report after you go home, um, one of the things, you know what he did when he left the, when he left the, the Dolphin training camp? He got in a car and took himself to the hospital because he wasn't thinking right. And he had already had suicide ideation. So he knew my thinking isn't right, my thinking isn't right. He wasn't saying, I'm gonna go kill myself, he just, my thinking's not right, my thinking's not right. So he knew enough, I gotta get somewhere. And that's exactly what he did, okay? So the rational thinking is lost, there's very little social supports, and there's an organized plan, and then divorced people are hired, widowed, separated, or single. Big positive for being married. It's okay, hang in there. What's your name again? Martina, hang in there. Don't worry about it. Someday your prince will come. Um, Bozo, wait for Mount. Wait, don't get a Bozo. Get a Boaz. I'll set it backwards. I'll set it backwards. Wait for a Boaz, not a Bozo. Not a Bozo. Boaz, not a Bozo. I'm sorry. That was backwards. Okay. Uh, it is getting late, and when I teach, my students can tell you, I don't teach my classes anymore because I get really punchy, and I say crazy things, like Bozo. Okay, so, being married is a positive thing for not wanting to kill yourself. <laughs> Isn't that great? Go <laughs> get married, you won't want to kill yourself. No, I'm, I'm joking, but if you're running a group and there's more people that are single in your group, that's a higher risk. Okay, moving right along. Uh, and then, of course, illnesses. If you've got an illness, a chronic, debilitating illness, let me tell you, I worked many years with chronic back pain. Back pain and headache pain, too, it worked out. Oh, come on, I'm still I can't do that bad. Oh, this is. When nothing takes away the pain, and I had two of those patients in the suicide. Because the pain was, not cancer pain, cancer pain is bad. But there's medications for that. With chronic pain, they don't give it to you because you get addicted. So there's a real thing, and I had two over the, over the years, and it's tough. Okay, last 10 minutes, last five or so minutes, here's what I want you to do. In your groups, um, one of you, you know, role play the person who wants to commit suicide, one of you be the leader, and you kind of help them talk it out. All right, go on. 